before Mike Tyson even existed. He was Charles Sonny Liston, the indestructible, or so boxing fans and experts thought. Most of America didn't want Liston to hold what was long considered the most glamorous title in sports, heavyweight champion of the world. But for a time, it looked as if Sonny would hold the title for a long time. Born in rural Arkansas, Liston had little education and spent his youth on the hard scrabble streets of St. Louis, where he had frequent run-ins with the police. Liston was in and out of prison and for much of his life associated with less than savory characters. As forceful a presence as Liston was inside the ring, he remained a mystery outside of it, even in death. Up next on Behind the Fights, we'll be joined by boxing experts Jack Newfield and Burt Sugar as we examine the mystery of Sonny Liston. How old were you when you had your first boxing match? Well, when I first started, I was about 13. I went to the gym and I got a selection, so I said, uh, <laughs> that's not for me. And, so, and then again, I waited until I got 18, and I was big, and I, had, I weighed 218. So I figured, I said, well, I'm a man, now I can take it on my own. <laughs> Liston must have been a fascinating character to you. He was, because I think he was, it was like, on the surface he was this sullen, sad, inarticulate monster. But I think deep inside he was uh, misunderstood and sensitive and wounded uh, and a real, like a tragic beast, almost like King Kong to me. Charles Sonny Liston was born May the 8th, 1933, on a little farm near Pine Bluff, Arkansas. He was one of 25 children born to a poor sharecropper. Most of his childhood and his adult life was surrounded by poverty and discrimination. His education was like any boy that lived on a rundown farm and on the streets of a slum neighborhood. I know Charles Sonny Liston. He's a good man and he's a kind man and worthy of a chance to contribute to society. I am Mrs. Sonny Liston. I realized what this guy's life was like, one of 25 children, uh, beaten every day by his father until he was 14, had welts on his back the rest of his life, could neither read nor write, uh, went to St. Louis, became a criminal, went to prison, was taken over by the mob in prison. The mob, Frankie Carbo and uh, John Vitale owned him from day one of his boxing career, and he hated being owned by the mob, but he could do nothing about it. They were his way out. But he projected this image that they wanted him to project of, of, of being intimidating, um, and looking at people as though he hated everyone, looking at writers as though he hated all writers. Uh, he mm -hmm. did hate, hate. One of the things that made him hate writers was that all the writers would make fun of him claiming to be a certain age when we all knew he was older. And to make fun of how old he was was hurtful to him because he didn't know how old he was. When he was born, all he did was chop down this tree. There was no birth certificate in, the, in rural Arkansas. Years later, we tried to reconstruct his age from police records in St. Louis, but he was always five, at least five or six years older than his publicists claimed he was. As you pointed out, the mob controlled Sonny Liston. Why did the mob want fighters? What did they do with their fighters? Well, the mob has always had a controlling interest in boxing. The mob controlled Primo Canera, who was the heavyweight champion in the 30s. The, most, the richest prize in sports is the heavyweight championship, and the mob wanted to get back control of the heavyweight title. Did they want to fix every fight, or did they want to have the best fighters to win every fight? They, in some situations, they wanted to fix fights for betting coups, uh, but with Liston, they wanted a heavyweight champion, and they knew this guy can, can, can knock out anybody if he hit them, and it was just a question of finding the right front managers, and they, they kept finding these priests in Philadelphia and Denver who were gonna, always going to rehabilitate Sonny and redeem him. Rehabilitation, it comes from the Latin word re habilis, 
And it means, uh, uh, basically, it means the changing of a man's character. I cannot accept this word rehabilitation as far as Sonny Liston is concerned. I would rather say that and think and be convinced of the fact that this is reorientation. Now, the first fight we're going to see, this is in 1958, when, according to the record book, he was 21 years old. He'd already been fighting for five years professionally. He already had a, a prison record behind him. So, obviously, the 21 may not have been good he arithmetic. Had a serious prison record, armed robbery, uh, assaults on police officers, uh, he began to fight in prison, uh, and from the beginning, and, and he was owned by the mafia. And, and he was seen from day one as, as a menace to civilization, a threat to, to, to the cleanliness of sports. Nobody wanted to see him become a contender. No one ever wanted to see him to fight for a title. But in 1958, he was beginning to be perceived as a possible contender. We're going to see now his second fight against Burt Whitehurst. Whitehurst went the distance with him the first right. time. Burt Whitehurst was a very cagey veteran, and he was one of the few guys Sonny couldn't knock out because uh, Sonny was one of these classic punchers with either hand like Dempsey or Lewis or, or later like Tyson. He had enormous punching power, and he knocked almost everybody out quickly. And at this point in his career, he had lost only once to somebody named Marty, Marty Marshall. Marshall. who he later knocked out twice. Okay, and now we will see fight two between Sonny Liston and Burt Whitehurst. Thirty seconds, and the crowd is rooting for the underdog here. At Burt Whitehurst, in white, Sonny Liston. about as close as we've ever seen a finish whether he was knocked out the bell rang and I don't know what the, whether the referee's going to call it a knockout or not is that a knockout the bell rang at seven it is not a knockout and the bell rang and the, uh, the referee said he was on his feet so it is not a knockout and for the second time Bert Whitehurst has gone the distance a very one of the most dramatic finishes we've ever seen in a fight the winner by unanimous decision, Sonny Liston. Sonny Liston. That's a decision for Liston, a decision about as close as you can get to a knockout. We've seen now the potential in Liston. Where does he go from this fight? Uh, why, why, most guys who fought Liston just try to survive rather than win. And Whitehurst was a survivor, a clutcher, a mover, a grabber. But He even went into the audience to escape. But right. a, a, a few other guys uh, did try to f f punch with Liston. One was Wayne Bethia who Liston knocked out in the first minute. And then he fought uh, Cleveland Williams, who was a very talented heavyweight. He was actually bigger in size than Liston. And later, he, he would fight Muhammad Ali in 1966. But Cle he fought Cleveland Williams twice. And Cleveland Williams went toe-to-toe -to -toe with him in both fights. Uh, he hurt Liston a couple times in the first fight, but in the second fight, he knocked him out in the second round. But Williams stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with him, and you can see Liston's punching power, his uh, character. Uh, he was not a quitter, as people came to think of him later on with Ali. He took a good punch. He did not have a weak chin, because uh, he took Cleveland Williams' best shots, walked through Cleveland Williams, and knocked him out. Was there any particular fight when you first realized that you, 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 you came in, you're ready to go, you could beat anybody? Cleveland Williams, when I fought Cleveland Williams after I went to the dressing room, and all the newspaper writers came in and said, we, now that we believe you can take it after that fight. And he must have been real tough. He was, he could punch real hard and he was fast. And after that fight, I felt that I could beat anybody. We're very happy to be able to visit with Mr. Joe Traynor, chairman of the Illinois State Athletic Commission. Joe, I wonder if you'd be kind enough to tell us why, in your opinion, New York did not allow the fight and you saw fit to bring it into Illinois. Frank, I don't know their reason. They didn't so state it. I, I believe, though, that they, they are not in favor of rehabilitation, whereas we are. I recall an incident we had with Rocky Graziano. 
when he came up for a license. He showed me his fists, and he says, Commissioner, this is the only way I know how to make a living. Uh, I'm sure he's never let you down since. No, he hasn't. He's been, he's been a credit to himself and to the game. Well, that's a very commendable attitude. Well, when they turned me down for a license in New York to fight for the championship, mm -hmm. something I've always wanted to do, it was kind of sad that they did it, but it, Chicago made me very proud of it. We're with Jack Newfield, newspaper man, author, and of course, like everyone else these days, a television commentator. Sonny Liston has now established himself as a, as a logical contender for the heavyweight champion of the wor world. Floyd Patterson is the champion. How did they get together in the ring? Well, actually, it's a, it is a fight made by John F. Kennedy, the president. Of course, yes. Uh, after uh, Patterson regained the title from Ingemar Johansson and then knocked out Johansson in the third and rubber fight, He's invited to the White House to meet President Kennedy. And in kind of small talk banter from crib sheets, uh, JFK says to Patterson, when are you going to fight Sonny Liston? <laughs> and Floyd Patterson is awed that the president would ask him this. He comes back to New York and he tells his manager, Customato, the president expects me to fight Sonny Liston. And Customato says, you can't beat Sonny Liston. You're not going to fight Sonny Liston. You're going to fight a bunch of stiffs for a few years. And Floyd says, no, I have to fight him. The president expects me to. I met the president of the United States, and he even said to me, you know, make sure you keep that championship. <laughs> you know, keep your example up. It was nice. But I would have much rather went up in the mountains somewhere and secluded myself away until I fought, and they'd come out, and then they would tell me, they say, if it's done, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. if I was successful. So at this point, Cus really didn't believe Floyd could win. Did Floyd think he could win? I don't think so. I mean, Cus knew he couldn't win. Cus had coddled Patterson. He had defended his title against really very weak challenges like Roy Harris of Texas and Pete Rademacher in his first professional fight. He had been coddled, protected. He did not have a good chin. Uh, I think Patterson is like a fourth tier I mean, he, heavyweight champion. He had knocked champion. down so many times by Johansson, of course. He had knocked Johansson down so many times, too. And at least he had the distinction of being the first person ever to regain the heavyweight championship that, that, of the world. That's right. But I, uh, he was not, uh, I think he lacked confidence against Liston. And, his, and it turned out that he was so uh, fearing that he would lose that he brought uh, a disguise to Comiskey Park in Chicago uh, a fake beard and a fake nose to, to hide thinking he was going to lose in advance and no champion ever thinks he's going to lose but Floyd Patterson believed he was going to lose. The challenger, favorite of the odds makers, enters the ring. Sonny Liston, winner of 33 of 34 fights. 23 of them by knockout. The most formidable challenger the champion has ever met. The champion, sentimental favorite, Floyd Patterson, winner of 38 of 40 fights, 29 of them by knockout. The youngest man ever to win the heavyweight title. The only man ever to win it twice. Liston's heavy jabs bother Patterson. Patterson's bobbing and weaving make Liston miss often. The Liston hook to the head is the first good punch of the fight. The challenger moving in. The champion shaking off the effect of that left hook. A left, a grazing right, and a solid left to the cheekbone, drop the champion. Sonny Liston, the 21st heavyweight champion of the world, jubilation for Floyd Patterson, the former champion, consolation.
the winner and the new world heavyweight boxing champion, Johnny Olympia. It took only two minutes and six seconds, but years of waiting. Listen as Floyd Patterson has praise and a plea in behalf of his controversial conqueror. Just a little too fast for me, I guess. Too fast? What Start about a return fast. match? Do you still want? Yes, I do. I think perhaps in the return match, maybe I'll do a little better. But there's one other thing I'd like to remark about. Yes, uh, although I was fairly beaten tonight, I think that if the public gives Sonny, like I've always said, their chance, I think that he will wear the championship probably just as good as I, if not better. I think he has inner qualities that are good. I think should give him a chance. I'm sure you're, you're uh, happy over Patterson's attitude. He said some nice things about you, Sonny. Yes, he did. I really was surprised <laughs> that he stood up for me like he did. And in the oversimplified world of boxing, evil has just defeated good. Uh, that Flo Floyd Patterson was sold as kind of the meek, safe, polite Negro to, in contrast to Sonny Liston, the ex-con, the strike breaker, the, the, the guy who's owned the by the mob. Right. Uh, although I have to say that 35 years after the fight, uh, I figured out that I actually have more respect for Sonny Liston as a, as a, as a human being than I did for Floyd Patterson and all this, I think, marketing uh, did not really appreciate the, the good side of, of Liston and a kind of a phony, petty side to Patterson that the, that the writers at the time neglected to expose. And which you didn't see at that time either. But now, here it is, it's after the fight, Sonny Liston should be on top of the world. The, the, the morning after the fight, Sonny flies back to Philadelphia with Jack McKinney, who's a, a journalist and a talk show host in Philadelphia and, a, and Liston's best friend. Yeah, and Liston is preparing a speech. He, is, he believes he has wiped the slate clean, that he's going to be a, given a chance to become like Joe Lewis, who's his hero. He's actually sitting with McKinney on the plane. Hel McKinney is helping him pr prepare a speech where he's promising to be a good champion and not uh, embarrass anybody. He just assumes there's going to be, the mayor is going to be there and there's going to be a big parade. And the plane lands in Philadelphia and nobody is at the airport. It was a crushing, crushing experience for Sonny Liston. It showed him that no matter what he achieved uh, in his life, he will never be able to overcome the outlaw image of, of negativity. Well, in the morning I get up at 5 o'clock and I run about five miles, eventually I work up to five, and after that I eat breakfast, take a walk for about a mile and a half, then I sit around for a few minutes, then I go back to bed, then I get up and come over and have me a cup of tea, and I start training, skipping ropes, hitting the heavy bag, light bag, boxing, to get my body in shape, then I go and have dinner. We're getting ready for the second fight between Sonny Liston and Floyd Patterson. And this fight is different in at least one way. Floyd Patterson didn't bring a disguise to this fight. And I don't want to give away the result, but I will tell you, this is a longer fight than the first one, which maybe had not been anticipated because nobody saw any way that Patterson could win the second fight, did they? That, that is true. I think this is Liston at his... Where is it? His peak is a kind of invincible monster, and at the same time, uh, and scaring opponents the way Tyson in his prime, I think, scared Michael Spinks uh, and Alex Stewart. People were afraid of. The professional fighters were afraid of Liston. He he looked unbeatable. This is the way Foreman was at one point in his career in his in his early 70s. And Floyd Patterson had, to a certain degree, shown fear in the ring during the first fight. Why would he go back and try to fight Liston again? What mechanism in a fighter makes him you know, think he's even going to survive to go into a ring like that? Uh, unless he was uh, a masochist, it didn't make any sense. He just did not have the talent or the punch to, uh, or the mobility anymore in his legs to, to deal with a guy like Liston. It's hard to conceive of any manager not wanting his fighter to go in for a big payday, but did Cus try to talk him out of it? Cus was vehemently opposed to him fighting Liston, and uh, the first, as I, time. first fight, and, as I recall yeah. it, Cus just didn't want him to fight Liston. It was a 
a doomed mistake. And Customato, as you'll see watching the second fight between Liston and Patterson, was not a Bring the former champion and now the challenger, Floyd Patterson, 28 years old, the only man ever to hold the heavyweight title twice. The heavyweight champion, Sonny Liston, 30 years old, and the man who won that title last September at Comiskey Park, Chicago, in two minutes and six seconds. Patterson trying to get underneath the champion straight punches, runs into a right uppercut, which sets up the challenger. fight has been stopped this time in two minutes and ten seconds. Custody Amata, who discovered Patterson, comforts his defeated protege. Liston receives the congratulations to the victor, scorns Cassius Clay, who's heard to say, Liston's not great, he'll fall in eight. Bert Sugar, boxing historian and writer, joins us now as we cover the short reign of Sonny Liston as heavyweight champion of the world. But after defeating Floyd Patterson for the second time, many people in and around boxing thought that, that Sonny Liston was invincible, that no one could beat him. He signs for his next fight against a 21-year-old kid about to be 22, Cassius Clay, who has won 19 straight fights. And now the buildup begins. Well, basically, Cassius Clay had baited Liston into this fight. He had been in the ring in Which both... Which everybody thought was you know, craziness on, oh, on, on his part. Oh, yeah. he had gone after him. He'd been in the ring at both the victories over Floyd, both in Chicago and Vegas, uh, sort of insinuating himself into Sonny's victory parties in both cases. He had gone to his home in Denver in what he called Big Red, his bus, to go bear hunting and bang on his door in the middle of the night in order to aggravate him. And the ultimate salesman. And he had even gone to Vegas before the Patterson second fight and tried to infuriate Liston. So he goes to Willie Reddish, who is Liston's trainer, and says, where is he? Where is he? Willie says, why don't you go on over and gamble over at the Sands? You'll find him. Well, Clay doesn't want to gamble at the Sands. He wants to get at Liston. He walks in, there's Liston at a crap table. And he starts screaming, jump, jump. And Liston doesn't look up. Jump, jump, I'm going to get you. And he's screaming for everybody to hear. Liston finally looks up in that baleful stare of his, pulls out a gun and bang, 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 bang. And Clay runs out as fast as he ever could. It was a setup. It was blanks. And Liston roared for an hour. He had gotten Clay. Now Clay's got to get back at him. And it went on like that until finally... Liston said, why not? He said, I'm going to kill him. It's going to take me a round and a half to catch that thunder jaw and half a round to knock him out. Let's do it. They sign. If Sonny Liston looks me, I'll kiss his feet in the rain. I'm not out of the rain on my knees. Tell him he's the greatest and catch the next cat out of the country. And they go to Miami Beach to get ready for the fight there. And now the atmosphere becomes as wild as it was in Vegas. Oh, I, everything about it. From the fact that Bill McDonnell, the promoter of the fight that's going to be held in Miami Beach Convention Center, 
is threatening to call off the fight unless Clay then renounces his heretofore public announcements about Malcolm X and Elijah Muhammad. Clay says, I'm walking out. He actually called his bluff. McDonald says, no, 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 it'll go on. That's scene set one. Scene set two, the day of the weigh-in, the afternoon of the evening fight. Here comes Clay. Up to then, weigh-ins had been quiet. Two people get on a scale, one steps off. And Liston is trying to get close enough to Clay to give him that death ray, baleful, stare you through look. He can't even get close to him because everybody's pushing around. But, but he's not just instigating at this point. He's acting crazy. I mean, as crazy at, as, as you can possibly act. At least to a sane person's eyes. Knowing that the one thing that Liston can't deal with and is afraid of is an insane man. And here comes the doctor over, and he takes his blood pressure. It's 200 over 100. He says he's scared to death. So the writers go run out and file. Jimmy Cannon said, fights off, man scared. <laughs> he goes back to his room, listens to the words of Elijah Muhammad for an hour. And within an hour, it's 54 again. I predict that tonight somebody will die that rains out from shock. Cassius Clay on the move as we see, looking to get Sonny to lunge, carrying his left hand dangerously low. Note that the champion, Liston, the aggressive man, Ooh. a good heavy shot dug under the heart. Sonny has to set the pace. That's the way it looks at the outset. Cassius, awkwardly fast. Good long left lead that might keep the champion a bit off balance. Sonny seems to be trying to slip those left leads. Can't do it too successfully because the challenger is jabbing all over. Body, head, and right hand. The best punch of the fight so far. The moment when Liston did not come out. How stunned were you? How stunned was everyone? Well, there were, there were two moments in between, number one of which was Liston got a small cut in the second round, which was open to a gash in the third by Clay's punches. The second thing that happened was in the fourth round, between the third and the fourth, and for the first time Liston sits down, he's tired chasing, his quarter starts to put liniment in his eyes, which we later found out was alcohol and wintergreen because he theoretically had a, a sore shoulder in training. That liniment gets into Clay's eyes, albeit two of Liston's previous opponents, Zora Foley and Cleveland Williams, had complained of their eyes stinging. Now it gets into Clay's eyes. Between the fourth and fifth round, he goes back to his corner, and he says, I can't see. He's wobbling around blindly. Get these gloves off me. Get these gloves off me. Angelo Dundee, runs, who's halfway down the steps, runs back up and says, this is your night, big daddy, and shoves him out in the ring, though he can't see anything in the fifth round. Secondarily, the black Muslims who are at ringside run over to, uh, to, to Clay's corner to get Dundee thinking he'd put the, the ointment in, in Clay's eyes, and, and Dundee, thinking quickly, puts it in his own, showing him there's nothing wrong with it. Right. Meanwhile, we've got going on in the ring, a man groping blindly. The referee's thinking of stopping the fight. Liston is wailing away at his body, almost unable to catch his head because he's leaning back in that famous Muhammad Ali later uh, act that he did against Foreman in, in uh, Zaire. Sort of a modified rope -a And Yes, and meanwhile, halfway through the round, his eyes clear. So while he's there, 
He stops in the middle of the ring with about a minute left and starts popping Liston again and raising welts under his eyes. And at the end of the fifth round, Liston goes back to his corner. It's all over. He goes through one more round, and now comes the end of the sixth, and he's sitting there, dejected, on his stool. And he spits out his mouthpiece almost as if it has a bitter taste. They might be stopping it. That might be all, ladies and gentlemen. Get up there, Joe. Get up there. Get up in the ring. Sonny Liston, at that point, was no longer invincible. This man, who wanted to be the baddest mother in town and took great pride in it, no longer was. Lewis and Maine adopts the heavyweight championship fight banned in Boston. Sonny Liston challenges Cassius Clay on a bright, placid day in May. And for a few hours, the eyes of the sports world focus on this normally quiet, northern New England industrial city of 41,000. Why did they pick Lewiston, Maine? It's sort of a meandering breadcrumb <laughs> tale. February, the fight's over. Almost immediately, they start talking about a rematch. It's in Clay hyphen Alley's contract. The people who own the contract are the Nyland brothers, who are Liston's managers, who are fronting for others, as, as you've pointed out. Let us just out. leave it at, at others. <laughs> others. Yeah. Uh, and there are rules in certain jurisdictions, New York being one, that a fighter cannot promote his, promote his own fight, particularly when he's the contender now, as Liston is, against a champion. Therefore, the fight is looking for a home. It initially finds one through promoter Sam Silverman in Boston for September of 64. However, Ali, on the almost fortnight of the fight, is diagnosed as having a hernia, goes in the hospital, the fight is canceled, the jurisdiction of Massachusetts decides they don't want this fight anyway, and now Silverman has got to find a place to put it. So he finds Lewiston, Maine. Oh, what a wonderful place. But he also <laughs> finds Jersey Joe Walcott to referee the fight. Yes, uh, Maine not having a, uh, a commission, if you will, makes it easy to put it in Lewiston uh, at St. Dominic's Arena uh, on top of ice. To make it you know, even more so, he brings in Jersey Joe Walcott as the referee. Put them all together. And it was chaos from the word go all the way downhill. The bell starts the fight. Does Walcott lose control right away? Well, there were other things on that fight, uh, Dick. Uh, they, they, because there was fear that Liston was going to be assassinated or that Clay, now Ali, because of Malcolm X, who had been assassinated in the interim, was also going to be a target, everybody was frisked on the way into St. Dominic's Arena. It was the biggest thrill I had in years. <laughs> but we all were frisked. We're sitting at ringside. Jimmy Cannon is looking for a place to go underneath his seat at ringside. Everything about this fight is strange, and the bell starts the second stage of strangeness. Clay takes the lead at the start. As he did the night he won the title, Clay uses the ring, makes Liston look slow. Liston stalks, tries for the body. Now Ali, circling to his left, he ain't nowhere to be found anyway. He's turning Liston. Liston now gets him near the ropes, which is more than he has done in the six rounds in Miami Beach and the half a round here. 
And as he steps in, play now Al Lieb steps over with a right hand, catches him coming in, his foot is off the floor, and he collapses. Now, instead of going to any neutral corner, because now the fans are screaming, it's a fake, give us our money back. Ali is standing over him, arms extended, hollering, get up, jump, get up. He doesn't want to be part of a fake. There is no neutral corner, two words that don't exist. Joe Walcott can't figure out what to do. He's not getting play away from Liston. They start fighting again. Almost, yes. No, they are. Yeah. They're over there slugging. Right. And Matt Fleischer, the editor of Ring Magazine, one of my predecessors at Ring, calls over Joe Walcott. He was down for more than 10 seconds. He might have been down for 20. Yeah, there was. wasn't a count of one. They're fighting. Walcott walks across the ring where he's left them, and they're still milling, and pushes him aside and raises Ali's hand. And Liston just looks and walks away. Meanwhile, the timekeeper says it's a minute when it's easily over two and a half. Right, right. Nothing about it is right, and it will go down as one of the greatest half the sides of the ring said phantom punch. The other half saw it. You saw the short right hand. I saw it. But, and he went down. He was coming in, so it landed about three times harder than it should have. If you look at the film carefully, you'll see his leg lifted. He is off the mat before he's down. Almost not quite as accentuated as Joe Fraser with George Foreman in the air, but you can see it. He caught him. Thank you, Bert, for your memories and for your analysis. Yeah. And Sonny was down, and his career was down, too. There he is. Charles Sonny Liston, blue robe, he'll be wearing blue trunks. The baleful stare, the scary training camp, the medicine ball into the belly and all the rest. He had a left that looked so long it could have been a lamppost and it seemed just as hard and the right was thunderous. And the whole image changed curiously in Miami Beach on a February night in 1964 when he sat on a stool. It is now 1969 or it is 1969 when we see the next fight and Cassius Clay, Muhammad Ali, has been stripped of his heavyweight championship. Unjustly, without due process, a tournament is underway involving Jerry Quarry, Joe Frazier, Jimmy Ellis, and Leotis Martin, and Liston, to crown a new champion during Muhammad's exile. So at this point, Liston has aspirations of getting back that yes. heavyweight championship. He is actually probably about 45 years old at this point. He has won 14 out of... But as we've found out since, that's young for a fighter, right? <laughs> he has won 14 out of 16 fights against hand-picked opponents. Leotis Martin was a very solid, technically sound fighter. Uh, but uh, he didn't, people thought he didn't have enough of a punch to compete with Liston. Minute left in this round. Sometimes he fights him from half distance, Martin does, and sometimes from full. Oh, there it was. It was overdue. The left hook got in there squarely, just off the side of the chin, and down went Leotis. First knockdown of the fight. It occurred with more than two minutes gone in the fourth round, and now Sonny consents it. He wants it, and he wants it fast. He's got 30 seconds left in this round, and he's got Martin hurt and wobbly. The leg's slightly rubbery, and he's got him against the rope. Just 10 seconds left in the round. Sonny will not do it in this round. Sonny Liston has just shown that while he's 45 years old, he may not be finished. He's in command, he's knocked down Leotis Martin, and he's got to be thinking at this point that maybe he will get that championship back. That, that is true. The, the only question now is how much gas does Sonny have left in the tank at this point in his life, at this point in his career. But you can see, even at 45, he's a much better fighter than Leotis Martin, who's pretty good. playing it really for a tired fighter quite cool fighting from the distance looking for the spot not wanting to expose himself there the right by martin oh this 
Jackson is knocked down with the right and then the left, and he is knocked out. This fight will be over, and with it, Charles Sunny Liston career. We're back live in the ring, as you can see, with Charles Sonny Liston. And Sonny, quite frankly, most scorers had you well ahead when suddenly the knockout came. Yes, it did. What, uh, what happened? Well, I know that maybe it wouldn't happen. In any event, Sonny, what do you feel now? Are you going to continue to fight, or are you going to pack it in? Well, it's hard to say. You haven't made a decision on it. Obviously, it's been very quick. Yeah. But... The cold fact is it will be harder than ever, Sonny, to go all the way up the trail after this defeat. Yes, it will. But I have to think it over here. Uh, all right, Sonny. I don't think it's right to hold you any longer. Thank you very much for coming on with us, okay, and good luck to you. Sonny Liston's bid to become the second man to regain the heavyweight championship of the world seems to be dead at this point. Uh, his, his career seems to be just about over. Where did he go from here? Well, I actually covered what proved to be his last fight, which was in the armory in Jersey City against uh, Chuck Wepner, the ba famous Bayonne bleeder. Uh, and what kind of a fight was that? It was very one-sided. Uh, Liston busted open Wepner's face. Not the first the, person to do that and not the last. And by the second round, the, f the fight was stopped in the 10th round. Wepner later needed about 100 stitches. It was one of the most bloody fights I've ever seen. It was very one-sided. Liston somehow, you know, through that, you know, powerful jab, had a lot left. I, Sonny did not have long to live after that but fight. He died six months later. And for this fight, he was paid $13,000, none of which he kept. He owed $10,000 to gamblers in Las Vegas, and they gave, he paid back that debt. He gave his cornermen 3000 and for his last fight, he cleared zero. And six months later, Sonny Liston was dead. What happened? He died under the very mysterious circumstances. His body was found after he had been dead six or seven days. Uh, there was heroin in his system. Uh, most people in Las Vegas think he was given what they call a hot shot by some element of the mob uh, or gangsters who were uh, who he owed money to. He was doing some strong on stuff for them in Vegas. But his wife, Geraldine, came back from a trip and found his decomposing body uh, in the bedroom uh, with blood coming out of his nose and uh, hypodermic needle marks on his arm. It's not hard to imagine a life like his ending that way. It is hard to imagine someone having the courage to slip Sonny Liston something like that. I think someone would have had to slip something surreptitiously to knock him out before they killed him. Yeah, that would be the safest way to do it. And as people say about... Listen, nobody really knows the day he was born, and nobody knows the day he died. Hello, you're watching where all this week in the